precisely because so much of the development happens in the downtown core. But the way I look at that, it's a kind of um, it's a, it, it kind of has a responsibility to the larger um, the, the larger region, which doesn't have nearly as good a track record. So I'd like to start with Edmonton. Um, this is a project where city council pulled out all the stops. Stephen Mandel's council did their homework. They actually traveled to some of those. Uh, some of those cities that Harrison Fraker presented in his in one of the earlier lectures in this series, Malmo, Hammerby, Sjostad, and the RFP that they put together really um, really detailed the kind of tenets of those sustainable communities. We were thrilled to be selected uh, from a short list that included the offices of Norman Foster, Bob Berkebile, and KCAP out of Amsterdam. It was a very high order. Um, and I'm going to explain a little bit of the project, but before I do that, uh, just to point out a few things. It was uh, uh, the municipal airport just two kilometers from the downtown core, so destined to become a part of the metropolitan core. 530 acres, Yellowhead Highway in this location here. And just to point out one of the city's um, most salient natural features, the North Saskatchewan River here with its series of parks and ravines, a, a kind of a real common imprimatur in the, uh, in the prairies. Um, the photograph at the top I include because that was our very first um, experience on the site. It's taken from midfield, and as you can see, the downtown core feels incredibly close, and it's something that we really wanted to capture in the plan. So here's the plan. Um, no pressure, a global model for sustainable city building. That's what council held out to us. And they, they put together a whole host of, of master planning principles for us to follow, a few of which include, or the key ones, that compactness, it was to be a, a, a neighborhood of 30,000 people. Completeness, um, a place where you could live, where you could be employed, where you could enjoy recreational and civic amenities as well as access to education at several different levels. And, and finally, it was to be carbon neutral. Um, they were asking for 100% uh, renewable energy on this site. All of these things combined to deliver uh, a reduced ecological footprint and probably most important, lifestyle choices, including um, the, the whole gamut of house, household choices and tenures. So just briefly on the plan, um, three uh, distinct neighborhoods embracing a very large park. We, when we saw the site for the first time, we elected to, um, we decided that we would preserve as much as 50% of the site. And we came very close. It's, I think it's 200 acres, this park, at the center of the site. Just to point out a few other um, things, Kingsway Mall down here to the south, very successful uh, commercial mall. Nate Northern Alberta Institute of Technology, which is the largest in Canada and a partner on the site. And uh, finally, this LRT line here, uh, currently under construction with the first station completed at this, this point. So I want to back up for a minute because all of our projects, in all of our projects, we try to distill our key drivers for the project, our key kind of goals down to um, some manageable concepts and diagrams. And really, with Edmonton, it came down to these four. And what we're learning as we uh, apply some of these things to our other projects is it's, these have really become the touchstones for all of our work. Um, and they are very much aligned with the work that Ray, Dr. Ray Cole's doing at UBC around regenerative neighborhoods. Um, starting with nature, it, this is really a, an idea about integrating nature in a much deeper way than we normally see it in an urban situation uh, for its biodiversity value, for its biophilic value, and also um, its promotion of, of um, CO2 reduction. Reparation of, of uh, er, the urban fabric is another one, primarily to facilitate mobility, but really giving that kind of physical and social connection that we all yearn for. Connection to growth, um, this is really all about diversity and looking for economic vitality in our communities. And finally, uh, connection to our past, which is something that uh, we all really look for in, in placing ourselves within our own communities. 
Specifically to Edmonton, um, what we saw was an, an area that was very underserved by green open space in the city. Uh, there's a lovely um, series of parks along the North Saskatchewan River, but in fact there's nothing to uh, anything close to the major city parks that we see in, say, Central Park in New York, uh, Mount Royal in Montreal, or um, even Hyde Park in Toronto. So we decided that um, this was that sort of 50% of the, the site that we preserved. Happily, there was already a park in place, a, a corridor that repurposed an old rail line that connects this park down to the river here. And we found some opportunities to connect it east-west to the river as well, creating, in the end, a 27-kilometer circuit that really embeds this park in the larger network of open spaces. And we called it the River to River Loop. With regard to uh, the urban fabric, uh, the site was, is fortunate to be surrounded by pre-war neighborhoods, which already have a pretty fine-grained grid. And so it, it didn't take much um, to actually extend that grid onto the site, which meant that the, peop the exi is existing neighbors would have access to all the amenities on this site and uh, the new residents to the rest of the city. That, that was the local connection. With regard to the regional connection, of course, there's the LRT, and that's something that we've embedded into the plan in a really um, active way. The site is blessed by um, some very uh, active uses around its edges. We've all, I've already talked about the mall, which we um, we um, were looking to, to become part of a commercial hub with the town center we had planned on the site. Nate, a partner, which would actually be taking over some blocks on the site. Uh, two hospitals, Canada's largest critical care hospital, hoping uh, here that there might be a ripple effect of um, bringing health services to the site. And in fact, there's already a health agency that has signed up to, um, to take one of the parcels there. Um, Lastly, we looked at, at industry, which uh, is that really elusive use. It's the one that um, seems to get erased so easily from um, city cores, and it's something that we tried very hard to, um, to retain and, and weave into the plan. And then lastly, the, um, there is an aspect of economic vitality uh, that goes hand in hand with heat and power generation, with energy, and that it, in this particular site, we were looking at the opportunity of actually uh, using the renewable energies uh, that we were providing and taking the excess heat off-site to those big consumers. Finally, with history, Edmonton, uh, uh, the airport, was the first <coughs> air harbor in the Commonwealth so quite a, quite a notable location. Um, we saw that the runways could actually work very well with the urban fabric, and they've become the kind of armatures of the new neighborhoods. In addition, the existing, uh, the existing hangars, uh, World War II mostly, are repurposed as community and uh, civic amenities. And the existing terminal, which is currently a First Nations school, will continue it in that role. Finally, an aviation museum down here will also broaden that uh, aspect of history on the site. So to the park, um, the, the real kind of centerpiece of the park, I guess, is a series of lakes. These are uh, stormwater lakes. No water leaves the site, and we call these the lakes that work while you play. Um, the excavated, I'm sorry, the excavated material from the lakes uh, is actually used to build this hill along with uh, excavated material from the development. The hill's 100 feet high. It actually has several purposes, not the least of which is protecting this northern end of the park, which has a skating lake, uh, from fierce winter winds and extending that um, period of use for the park. Just to point out one thing on the edge of the lake here is the, um, this is one of the runways repurposed as a public promenade, a kind of civic uh, amenity where one could expect to see Edmontonians coming for their Sunday strolls. And so we talked uh, at the beginning, I was talking with somebody about this being a winter city, and of course it is. These red pavilions along this promenade are actually heated with geothermal heat, again, to extend 
the season and allow people to come out and enjoy this park at any point in time. Just a, a very brief overview, um, the destination park here, and uh, it's, mostly, um, it, it's mostly native landscape, Aspen, uh, um, Aspen parkland, integrating, extending into the communities through these parks with the ravine-like <coughs> parks in the east neighborhood and more agrarian-like parks in the west neighborhood. There's all sorts of walking connections through the park and of course the river to river loop that connects it then regionally to the city. I just want to point out this orange line which is um, that promenade I talked about. We've called it the Northern Lights, one of Edmonton's notable um, natural features. It's broken into three zones. Um, the first being more recreational, somewhat hard edged but softening where those ravines actually issue into it and through a cleansing um, wetland area. This takes us down to the epicenter of the community, um, a, a plaza that we've named after uh, one of the most famous bush pilots uh, in Edmonton, in Edmonton's history, Wat May. It's actually the, the promenade kind of wends its way through this plaza and as well we're integrating the stormwater through and into a series of biofiltration beds as they make their way back into the stormwater lakes. This is really the, the celebratory space for the, for the community and uh, it's also the nexus of the two runways. The, the promenade becomes uh, softer as it makes its way into the town center and this is primarily to give that, um, to, to really contrast with the high density buildings and, and blocks that we have throughout the, the town center. With regard to land use, looking at these larger regenerative sites, mixed use is a huge part of this and uh, you can see that housing is the bulk of the use here. It's from the light, light yellow low density to the ochre high density. But I want to point your attention to the town center, which is 250,000 square feet of retail along these four blocks. Watmay Plaza at this end and Kingsway Mall at the south end, which really becomes a partner in this urban, uh, in this commercial hub. Several um, neighborhoods serving commercial nodes as we make our way up through the community. And then three schools, um, two high schools and the um, First Nations school as well as Nate with 43 blocks, um, partly supporting student housing, partly academic uses, but perhaps most importantly, some of those storefront uses um, that can showcase Nate programs like um, their health services and also um, their award-winning culinary, um, culinary program. Two last things to point out, um, a water treatment plant here um, to treat the um, the, the water captured from sewage, and a biomass plant at the north end of the site, uh, which I'll talk about in a moment. With all of this, um, the idea is to create, we create 11,000 jobs, which is basically one job per, per um, person on the site. I won't go into this in great detail. The walkability was a, was a huge aim of the plan, and this fine grain network um, uh, was put in place to achieve that. Um, the transit, of course, is a huge part as well of reconnecting the city to the city. And it's not just the regional transit, but also a local tram on what we call Bush Pilots Runway, as well as existing and local buses. There's also a very complex bicycle uh, network that I won't share with you tonight, but all of those, um, all of those uh, layers of mobility together creating a community where you can, um, you, can, you can get to anywhere in the city very easily without using a car. Just briefly through the, the three neighborhoods that make up the plan, and you'll see this is really um, probably the most unique of the neighborhoods. We call it the agri-hood because Edmonton was very keen on people being able to grow food where you live. There are 600 um, community gardens uh, associated with this neighborhood. Uh, they're by and large in the, uh, in the park spaces, the furrows, which one of which is depicted here, but they're also um, outside of, of some of the row houses. So you might have 
uh, a garden plot in your, in your backyard. Um, this is Bush Pilots Runway. There's a, there's a series, as I said before, of nodes that are neighborhoods serving commercial. This is what it might be like. The density in this neighborhood is the lowest. It goes from uh, row houses to between four and six story buildings generally, and occasionally higher density in those nodes. Um, the next neighborhood is, is the Technology and Research District. And this is, again, a more urban district. Why? Because it's actually taking advantage of the LRT that runs through the center. Uh, but you can see that we've tried we, we've really tried to kind of layer on that green network I talked about with um, transit and, and, and other uh, mobility networks so that this um, rendering here gives you a sense of what it would be like to move through one of these ravines on your way to the edge of the lake. And this being that promenade, a kind of closer look at the northern lights. Lastly, the town center, and this is the most urban of all of the neighborhoods. Um, it's the only neighborhood that actually has towers. Uh, the first thing they told us in Edmonton is we don't want any towers. Um, it was through many conversations that we actually managed to get just a handful. There, there's nothing higher than 18 stories, and you have to earn the top three stories of that. Uh, a million square feet of office in here, again, served by the LRT. And this is uh, Watmay Plaza, that uh, kind of central plaza right at the very heart of the um, of the community. We talked about the mandate for renewable energies, and this is something we took very seriously. Um, it, it, the idea is a biomass plant that's fed by Edmonton's uh, award-winning waste management system, as well as dried sewage sludge and wood chips that go by on the, uh, the railway just above the site, uh, two trains a day. Um, this is complemented by a geothermal system about five kilometers deep. And essentially, with uh, these two generators of energy, we get to a net um, zero carbon community. But the real um, magic, I think, of this plan was the realization that with the excess heat from uh, those, we could actually feed a lot of the large consumers off-site. And I pointed those out before, but this would actually um, create a stream of revenue um, and um, return that to the community. This is a bit of a cautionary tale. Um, as I said, council's aims were huge. Uh, unfortunately, a new council was voted in just before the plan was approved. And in their own words, they scaled back on some of the aspirations of the plan. Um, the good news is, though, that uh, there's an RFP that was just um, awarded to um, uh, Urban Strategies out of a Toronto, a very good um, urban design firm, to take uh, the town centre to uh, the next level of detail, um, and along with that, a business case. So uh, they're all, they've also got um, a study underway for uh, the district energy. So. It seems like all is not lost, and we're keeping our, our fingers crossed. Um, interestingly enough for us, though, uh, we have a client who owns the Kingsway Mall immediately south of the site. And in fact, we've just completed uh, a master plan for them that looks at a sustainable community. So who knows? Maybe we'll um, beat Blatchford to the chase. Um, I want to go to Vancouver now. And this is a project um, that with um, the new old council in place, we hope, might have some legs. Um, if any of you are um, recall, Jeff Meggs, of course, was, was a real champion of taking down the viaducts. Um, it was really the only piece, this one and a quarter mile long, it was the only piece of a citywide express or a downtown expressway that was proposed in 1968. Um, you can see it right here. And happily, um, we were engaged just after the um, ideas competition that the city put on to um, investigate what the city, what the site actually might, the potential of the site. Uh, just to point out a few things, uh, Dunsmuir Viaduct to the north, Georgia Viaduct to the south, uh, the two city-owned pieces of land that um, currently accommodate the ramps, the LRT system ending in Stadion 
station here, um, BC Place and GM uh, uh, Place here, and of course, um, Andy Livingston Park in this location here. So the site was not always on land. Um, this is what George Vancouver probably would have seen when he arrived in 1792. This is Granville Island at that point in time. Uh, over time, it was filled in, though, to, um, to, to provide for industry and for the rail lands. You can see the faint rail tracks here. And we studied the, um, we studied the historic shorelines to give us some clues as to how we might approach this sort of a repeating bay here and here in 1917 and the 1955 shoreline, and this repeating channel that you see here as well. Bob Rennie's uh, advertisement for the Olympic Villages uh, was of real interest to us because it really called home the fact that the views to the North Shore Mountains are golden for um, sales, but they're also something that are, are, I think, very deeply a part of our psyche here in Vancouver. We had the opportunity to meet with the jury from the Ideas Competition in the uh, Creekside Community Center and in a room that looked out at the North Shore Mountains. And basically, they, to a person, they said, you really have to keep this view. You really have to retain it. And that, that worked, supported very much our idea of creating a destination park at this end of False Creek, a kind of counterpoint to Stanley Park, and I would argue also a real contrast to that series of what feels, for all intents and purposes, like a, a series of, of uh, semi-public front lawns around False Creek. Um, the big role for this park, I think, and, and this community is really to tie the existing neighborhoods around it back to the water, particularly the downtown east side to the north and Chinatown to the east, um, of course, this being the, the east edge of the downtown. So in terms of re repairing the fabric here, the big, some of the big moves included taking Georgia Street down to Pacific Boulevard, um, at 5%, there's currently, an RF, or the, uh, there's currently a consultancy out right now um, to study how that can be done technically. One of the big ideas that we um, borrowed from the competition was the idea of bringing Expo and Pacific, Pacific Boulevards together into one grand boulevard. And we took as our inspiration the work that Alan Jacobs and Elizabeth MacDonald had done in San Francisco on Octavia Boulevard essentially um, central through lanes and very quiet um, side lanes or multi-way boulevards as they call them, and this being the, the section down here. Of course, on top of that, um, the pedestrian connections were critical here, and we've got two on either side here with a major at, coming from the end of Carroll Street that we um, are calling straight to the creek. This is the plan. Um, just very quickly, the Main Street blocks are, will continue to be owned by the city, and the idea is to create affordable housing as well as social housing in this location. We tried to follow the pattern of the, the Main Street blocks as much as possible, but also ensure that there were public spaces uh, through the center of the block to connect you back to the water. This parcel here, uh, a bit more contentious, the very last uh, parcels in the Expo lands owned by Concord. There have been many, many um, uh, attempts at uh, putting some concepts together here. The jury's still out on exactly what those will be, but we felt that it was important to not to draw the towers along the face of the LRT and to keep that park open and that view open. Uh, just to point out a couple of other things, um, reconnecting the, the bikeway so that you do have that complete um, seawall connection, and also a new um, bike connection to replace the Dunsmuir viaduct with um, a path through the park and a bike bridge. So this is what it would look like three-dimensionally. One of, the, one of the, the sort of benefits was creating a new edge for the downtown core. We felt that this was, this was really interesting in terms of being making the city more legible. 
Um, we also, you'll also see from this study, we were attempting to um, recreate the, the, some of those inlets that I talked about, um, this being a kind of new way of thinking about engaging with the water in, in an urban way, and this being rather an opportunity to perhaps think about recalling some of the, uh, the canals that one finds in, in Chinese cities to, um, in, in honor of, of Chinatown here and Dr. Sun Yat-sen Garden at the terminus. So this is the, um, the overall view of the park. We were very much um, inspired by André Citroën Park in Paris. Um, why? Partly because we saw the importance of this being a destination park, but we really felt that the neighborhoods around it needed that opportunity to have a kind of sense of their own park spaces. And so this straight to the creek promenade actually gives you access to all sorts of smaller parks along the way could be anything from sculpture gardens to urban agriculture to um, a, a replacement of the skateboard park, perhaps. Um, the new plaza at the terminus of Georgia Street, and of course that uh, new connection coming directly through from the Main Street blocks. So to the last project, Saskatoon is, um, after Calgary, uh, the, supposedly the, the, the fastest growing, uh, the second fastest growing city in Canada. This is primarily due to their potash industry, their high tech industry, and more recently, uh, oil and gas um, finds. This is, uh, as it says, uh, very close to the downtown. The downtown is to the right of the screen, um, 240 acres, Saskatoon's historical rail lands, now primarily industrial, as you can see. Um, just to point out a few things, the, the very iconic uh, flour mills at the uh, north end, these are still operational. Um, SIAST, again, a, a, a technical institute which has, has a very large presence in Saskatoon. A new police building um, that it was just completed as we started the plan, and the warehouse district down here which is becoming a, a more and more vibrant district within the city. The big challenge here, of course, is this rail line that runs right through the center of the site, 45 meters wide and an active CPR rail corridor. Um, happily, there's another rail line here which was actually decommissioned and we've made that part of the plan. One of the big principles then, of course, in terms of repairing the urban fabric was reconnecting this site, not just with the city, but with uh, Saskatoon's River, the uh, South Saskatchewan River, a really uh, beautiful natural amenity. And we did that in several ways, um, both connecting east-west uh, as well as north-south, making use of that CN rail corridor and introducing new streets um, where we could on the, the easterly side. Saskatoon's also got a really wonderful array of uh, city parks. They're not particularly well connected though, and we saw the site right here as the opportunity to actually um, start to think about a green network that brings all of these parks together. On the east, the Hudson's Bay Parks here, connected through to Kinsman's Parks, and this would be by um, bike paths and, and greenways. And in the north, uh, a cemetery, but also an arboretum that would take you straight down to the city's premier riverfront park, just finished uh, in the last couple of years, River Landing. So very early on in the project, we looked at, um, th this was really the plan that we started with. Uh, the city wanted to, uh, you can see that it's fine, finely grained, it's connecting all those um, streets uh, that exist in the surrounding neighborhoods, so trying to make it as connective as possible. The city wanted two bridges here, and the more that we thought about it, the more that we looked at it, uh, we felt the bridges were actually aggravating the gap rather than helping it. Um, we put a pretty blue sky solution in front of the city, um, which was this one, that actually took the land and swept it over top of the CN Rail Corridor as a park, a block-wide city park, and um, in so doing, Really, we felt connecting the, the two sides of the neighborhood in a much more um, 
in a much more successful way. Uh, interestingly enough, um, it was enough to get the city behind it. They, they were really uh, excited about this prospect. Uh, we had started the, the plan with a mayor asking us, telling us he wanted to put Saskatoon on the map with this plan. Um, and he thought that was, would probably uh, be in the form of a 100-story tower. So we were happy that we could convince him that perhaps a neighborhood park would be a better way to go. We looked at uh, quite a number of precedents while we were um, thinking about this. And probably most of you are familiar with the Olympic Sculpture Park in Seattle. Uh, not only does it um, provide for a lot of public parking, but it also um, bridges over a major rail corridor as well as a major arterial taking traffic in and out of the city. So this is the park. Um, one of the uh, real benefits of uh, building this 5% uh, slope uh, bridging over the railway was finding that we could accommodate quite a bit of parking here, which is sorely in need in this particular area, not just for the local hospital, but also for businesses that are currently relying on surface parking within the industrial lands. Um, looking at, again at native uh, landscapes, the, the, the Aspen uh, parkland largely, uh, this is a view from the west side of the bridge right here and uh, a community facility on this side to enliven the park through um, through all the seasons. Um, the CN corridor plays a big role in this, connect, in this network as well. This is it here, and it essentially goes from a very large park in the north area with urban agriculture and dog parks, that kind of thing, to a much more urban situation as you make your way further south, um, which would be more like this. And we came up with a, a sort of veneer, what we call a veneer housing, that um, would be built here while these blocks were actually developed, because right now they're, 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 the actu they're actually the back of commercial blocks on this city street here. So this is the plan. And you can see, again, it follows the, um, the idea of these, the, the, the courtyard block. Um, lower density than, um, than Edmonton, but essentially creating a new community for about 8,000 people. Um, just to point out a few things, the police station here and um, the, uh, this, the warehouse district in this location. This is a view from the, um, the easterly side of the bridge park. And of course, this is the CN corridor looking straight to the downtown core. Just a few more slides left. And this is the um, looking at the land use. Really, the site was blessed because, again, a lot of um, pretty active city center uses around the perimeter. Really, uh, this idea was to create new mixed use to interface with that. Some of it up in this area integrating uh, a lot of the industrial uses that we found on the site. Again, largely lower density with um, the higher density only around the park where more people could take advantage of this green space. It's very quickly just through the three neighborhoods, each one anchored by a heritage building that recalls uh, Saskatoon's reason for being, I guess, the, um, the, 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 the grain industry. Uh, the mills here, they will remain active for some time, but we did put in front of the city several, um, several uh, schemes that incorporated uh, other uses looking at precedents like the Mill District in Minneapolis, which some of you might be familiar with, a very vibrant um, 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 new, uh, new district in Minneapolis the, with restaurants and museums, galleries, and lots of people living down there. As well, we were looking for park space that might actually be very dramatically backdropped by this series of uh, silos. Perhaps the, the most ambitious neighborhood is the Crossrail District. This is the neighborhood that's actually joined by the park and, again, anchored by Great Western Brewery. It's been there since 1928 and has a very active pub as well, so right in this location here on your way through to the river. Um, the section shows you the park, um, shows you the higher buildings flanking the park, taking advantage of that larger space, and, again, um, some of the kind of more urban um, urban block typologies 
that um, give us that kind of higher density, but also more affordable housing in this location. Finally, the, um, the warehouse district at the south end of the city. Um, this is actively being uh, rejuvenated. A lot of the warehouses are like this one here or this one here. They're being repurposed as lofts, as offices. It's a really, it's a real happening place. And the city's just reopened 25th, this road here. The first block in the entire development is here, and it'll have a grocery store to kickstart the community, um, as well as housing and office space. And it's depicted in this rendering uh, here. Perhaps the most interesting part of this neighborhood, though, is this building here, the John Deere building, which the city has gifted to uh, the University of Saskatchewan. And they're currently in the process of um, repurposing this as a school of architecture. So a post-secondary institution, again, bringing real vibrancy to this part of the, the city. So South, this is a really ambitious plan for Saskatoon. Saskatoon's only 250,000 people. Um, but they didn't stop at the North Downtown. And I think this is really um, my uh, message tonight, is that I think any cities that are looking at um, these brownfield sites need to think about their role in the larger city. Uh, with North Downtown, it's part of a much larger uh, initiative that's underway, um, which we were happily just engaged to do with Urban Systems. It's looking at the future transit lines across the city and all of those opportunities for transit-oriented development, whether it's along a corridor or around a mall like this. And I think that um, is, is something that here in Vancouver we need to give a lot more thought to. Uh, there are a lot of brownfield sites that are coming on stream very soon. Um, Pearson Dogwood, uh, the Jericho Lands, the city's also looking at the, the Eastern Core, the, the False Creek Flats. And I think it's, it's, these, are, these are wonderful opportunities for regenerative, de regenerative design. Uh, however, um, I guess with the new council, the new old council, uh, now into its third term, um, it would be really wonderful if uh, the planning department were given the support and the room it needs to look more holistically at the city and um, really drive these brownfield and greyfield sites with regard to regen regenerative design, but within the context of a much larger roadmap that looks at urban regeneration citywide in Vancouver. So I'm going to leave it at that and um, open the floor to questions. Thank you. Thank you. We do have time for questions, so I'll turn it over to you. Who would like to begin? Well, I think the answer to that is it, uh, there's absolutely a role for them. And uh, I couldn't get into the detail of it tonight, but we definitely, both in Saskatoon and in Ed Edmonton, looked at typologies that actually, um, block typologies that had an in a light industrial component. It's not that difficult to do. Um, you know, I mean, uh, an interesting example would be um, Acton Austries, Kingsway, Honda, um, you know, that's, that's kind of a big box. Um, I, I think it's fair to say kind of light, light industrial, and, and that can be done easily. Uh, and cer certainly it's something that we would push in any of our plans where there is an opportunity for, um, especially where there has been industrial, I think there's a really easy argument to say, why not 
weave that into some residential as well. Good question. Um, I, I, I think the short answer is that they've left the door open to actually um, reintroduce a lot of the strategies of the plan. Um, I, I, I think the council was, uh, I think one of their big problems is that all of a sudden they decided they needed to make this project break even on day one. That's practically an impossibility with a plan of this um, sort of magnitude and ambition. Uh, unfortunately, the, the council, I, I, I think, was very naive in that regard. Um, and we did our very best to argue the case. Um, but I think what they're finding over time is that there's been a lot of pushback from the community. And they are, in fact, like I say, they've got a district energy study underway. And um, happily with this consultancy on the town center and a business case to go along with it um, by an outside consultant, they put their own business case together, um, which was also a problem. Uh, with an outside consultant, I'm, 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 I wouldn't say much more optimistic, but I'm optimistic that um, they might actually um, bring a lot of what we put in place back to the plan. Joyce, thanks for the talk. And I guess just a follow up to that. Um, I was in Edmonton when it went south and followed in the local news, and, and uh, that's crazy for taking a chance. Most architects and urban designers do not just fly over and go on to the next project. But you were public, in fact, probably more frank in an Edmonton journal than you did tonight uh, <laughs> about what happened. Um, so you can say whatever more you want about that. I've got a specific urban design question. As you know, I grew up here. I grew up with a mile from my mentor is Doug Cardinal and Peter Hemingway have their offices there. Stan Tech, Stanley Engineering have their building. Like it's a really interesting part of the city and, and mm -hmm. we're the north of the, the city. And I learned to fly in that airport. I've got, I've got a lot of memories of it. But I'm just curious, uh, when you came up with kind of Portland-like small block, especially for the southern end of it, I want to talk a little bit about that decision in block form. Because a square, smallish block was not what had first come to mind for me uh, for that site, with its broad expanse of width and its lack of other containing devices. So maybe just talk a little bit about those specific decisions at the south end. It, it really is only at the south end, as you point out, um, where we've got the, the most intensive mix of uses. We were really looking to make it as comfortable a neighborhood as possible for walking around in any season. And in fact, when we went to the public consultation, there was uh, a, an older fellow that stood up and said, I remember downtown Edmonton when there wasn't a surface parking lot in sight, and you could walk comfortably in the downtown core um, in the middle of the winter. And, and that, I think, sort of um, was a bit of an inspiration for us, and we thought, well, why don't we try for much tighter, much smaller blocks only in the town center to make it as vibrant as we possibly can? It was also sort of a counterpoint to the mall at the time. Um, we, we hadn't actually um, um, been engaged on the, on the mall site, but something really tight and, um, and kind of comfortable, really, is what we were after. Uh, it's hard to tell from newspaper images and these, but what are the dimensions they're about 80 by 120. So that's just a little bit bigger than Portland block? Yeah, they're, they're, they're tiny. They're not, they're not big blocks. And uh, actually, to be frank, that's one of the, uh, one of the things the Edmonton developers uh, took umbrage with, quite frankly. They, they wanted much, much larger blocks. And that's one piece of the plan that I think is going to be very difficult to um, regain, is they, they have. Um, in Edmonton has elected to take out a lot of the streets 
Um, I think the, the plan can still be successful, but um, that, that part of it for us was probably the biggest blow. Um, because I think that kind of very fine, dent, very, very fine grained um, block pattern is something that we don't have enough opportunities to experience in contemporary cities. So it's kind of, um, kind of sad for us. Yes, down here, how many people have questions I want to engage tonight? <coughs> okay. I was in Edmonton last week when it hit minus 15 over at and I was curious as to whether there was any talk about plus 15 underground, interconnected, people interconnected in the civil division. Uh, plenty. <laughs> Uh, uh, there was a lot of people talked about that as being the solution, and that's a place that we definitely didn't want to go. Um, the underground was easy because um, a lot of people there. There was a, a um, there was a, an underpass in the city where evidently somebody drowned at some point in time after a rainstorm, and um, so that one was easy because uh, at all the public consultations, there were there was nothing that was going to go underground. Um, with regard to the plus 15, it took, I mean, there were quite a few people that thought that the plus 15 might be successful crossing Princess Elizabeth to the mall, um, those, kinds, those kinds of connections. But by and large, I think people saw the value of being on the street and engaging with their neighbors. Um, plus 15s are, are, they're tough at the best of times, and that's when you're right downtown in a very intensive city core. It's a lot harder to pull off in a place like this and not something we would have advocated for. We would really see this as transit-oriented development, so I'm, I'm not I'm, I'm not quite sure what your question is. <laughs> Right. Well, I, I guess, I mean, the, the, the real luxury here is there were 530 acres to deal with, and so um, that was uh, really when you're given sort of carte blanche, it, it allows you to kind of um, integrate all those systems in a better way, I think. Um, I, I salute Edmonton for their, their TOD initiative that's underway. They're, they're really taking it seriously. Um, this is just one part of it, but I, I think, again, this needs to be part of that kind of bigger picture. Uh, Joyce, one of the themes of the fall has been uh, the value of, uh, or the uh, comparison and contrast between master planning, uh, which I think these uh, demonstrate, and also uh, a view of urban design or urbanism as uh, incremental, on the other hand. So you've got uh, deep experience. So uh, do you have anything to say about uh, the uh, agony and ecstasy of master planning and the agony and ecstasy or possibilities of a more, uh, of an acceptance of incremental development of the city? Well, I think Vancouver already with the laneway housing is, is proving that incremental um, development can be successful. Um, and I'm certainly a, an advocate for that as well. I, I think I don't think it's either or, though. I think they, they have to work hand in hand. And um, you know, they're they're. I, I think master planning is hard. It's 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 very difficult work. There's so many agendas at play, and it's it's a very political sport. Um, you know, it's um, it's something that. I would argue can be incremental because most of these master plans are actually built out over 25 or 30 years. And so if the plan is sufficiently robust and you have a good um, 
governance around the plan, meaning some kind of arm's length group that can um, make decisions about it, I think you can, um, it can change over time significantly and, and um, have that kind of in incremental aspect to it as well. Okay, thank you. Last call. One back. Um, where the plan's at right now is it's been on hold since the election was on the horizon. Um, but we're very hopeful, uh, given that vision is back in place, that um, they will carry on with their aim to take it down. With regard to the stadium, um, are, are you, you're referring to the public plaza and Georgia Street, is that what you mean? Yeah. Pacific, yeah. There, there absolutely is, and that that was part of our work is is investigating how that could happen. In fact, <laughs> what we did try to do uh, along um, both sides of Georgia Street is in fact mitigate the that kind of wall-like feeling. And on the stadium side, um, there's only a few steps uh, in this plan that separate you from between that separate the street from the plaza. So, so the, it's effectively contiguous space. Um, it, it was, um, and then when you get down to here, down to the water, the idea was for a very large civic plaza that would be appropriate for the end of our um, most ceremonial street. on these things for eons. <laughs> it's not that hard. Hey, oh how are you? <laughs> yeah. That was great. Let's, um, oh, God, how do you feel? Uh, you know, after a while, it feels kind of wooden when you, because you've presented you it so many great. times. Yeah. No, you sounded great. And putting the three together was great. Well, thanks. 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 I, I was just thinking of you the other day. Oh, well, let's discuss. Oh, I'm going to get out.